So I will start by writing the classical LSV formula. The LSV stands for Ekedal, Andor, Shapiro, and Weinstein. Lando, Shapiro, and Weinstein. So it's an equality <coughs> between uh, Herbert's number that I will explain in a moment on the left hand side and on the right hand side you have a combinatorial coefficient and the main part is an integral on the moduli space of stable curves here you have the total term class of the dual of the Hodge bundle, again I will explain in a moment and here you have some expression with psi classes So I will try to briefly recall the meaning of all this, <coughs> so as not to take the whole hour. So I made a little picture of the moduli space. Here it is. <laughs> so that's the, this thing is the moduli space here of genus G <coughs> stable curves with n marked points. As you see, points of this moduli space correspond to stable curves. If you take a point at random, like here, it's going to be a smooth three-man surface. But then there is a divisor with normal crossings, and points of this divisor correspond corresponds to curves with self-intersections. And then when you have a point <coughs> on the intersection of this divisor, you have two nodes, one here and one here. Here you have one node, here you have two nodes. <coughs> so that's uh, the component, th this is called the boundary, that's the component of the boundary that corresponds to non-separating node, so if you normalize this curve it stays connected here have a component where if you normalize the curve it, <coughs> it becomes disconnected there are several components like that okay and now on every curve you can you have n, n marked points n marked points and you can take the cotangent line to the first marked point for example you see this is the cotangent line to the first marked point on each fiber of the universal curve, so the union of all these curves is, a, is called the universal curve. Looks like tangent. Yes, but I can... <laughs> <laughs> looks like tangent, yes. I, I, I cannot draw the cotangent line. <laughs> and and you, again, so as you see now, you have a complex line over each point of the moduli space, so all together they form a line bundle that is called L1. Because I took the first marked point. And similarly, you can define L2 and so on up to Ln. So you have n line bundles, and their first term classes are called psi, the psi classes. So psi i is the first term class of L i, and it's in the Tuco homology of M G n bar. And then you also have uh, the Hodge bundle. So that's the Hodge bundle. Uh, and that's the space of, so the, the fibers of this Hodge bundle are spaces of abelian differentials. So if you take, let's, let me call this map pi, for example, and then E is the push forward of omega rel of the relative cotangent line bundle. So if you take the cotangent line bundle to the fibers, the sections on each fiber are abelian differentials on this fiber. And over each point here you have a dimension G space of abelian differentials. So this is a rank G vector bundle. Vector bundle. And in this formula you have its dual. So this is well known since 2000. <coughs> Now I'm going to write another, yeah, another very similar formula that is still not proved, so it's a conjecture. Let me push all that. Oh no, yeah. Before, before, before that, I should sorry, Before that, I should explain the Hurwitz numbers. There is also the left-hand side, and that will allow me to 
make a transition between the two cases. So H G K one K N is the number of uh, ramified coverings, ramified coverings uh, of CP1 of a sphere, it's actually the complex structure here is actually not important because it's a topological invariant. Of CP1 with uh, uh, via genus G surface, genus G surface. Um, okay, so this will be CP1, this will be infinity, and here I will fix M more simple branch points. And so the conditions for the, the, the ramified covering, covering that I want to enumerate have n pre-images of infinity of orders k1, kn. So the degree of the covering is equal to capital K, which is the sum of the ki's. And then I have as many simple ramification points as needed. I don't know how to draw that, something like that. <laughs> right, all these are simple ramification points and their images are all fixed here in the, in the target. And you can, believe me, or you can compute the other characteristic and check that M, this number M should be equal to 2G minus 2 plus n plus k. If you want this surface to be of genus G, that's the number of simple branch points that you have to, that you have, that you have to fix. Okay, so now how do you compute this if you want to actually compute this from its numbers? Let me first of all introduce a generating series. Uh, H of beta and then P1, P2 and so on is going to be the sum over n and g and sum over k1, kn uh, beta to the m divided by m factorial h, g, k1, kn uh, pk1 and so on, pkn divided by m factorial so maybe I should make one small comment that uh, this number m here, or the genus, are uh, expressible uh, right there, there. They give the same information. So I prefer to write g the genus here, but the number m here is expressed from the genus. And I could also write m and express g from m. That would be equivalent. Okay. So now I'm going to write an expression for this, uh, for this function in terms of the representations of the symmetric group. Okay, so first of all, let, let me introduce a notation. P of sigma, if sigma is a permutation, permutation, uh, then P of sigma is going to be the product over the cycles of sigma cycles of sigma, P sub length of the cycle. So let's say C, length of C. Okay, so if sigma, for example, is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, P of sigma is going to be P3 times P1 times P2 squared. Okay? So now let's denote by T2 the sum of transpositions 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 in S capital K. So capital K is the degree of this covering or the sum of the Ki's. Okay, and then I claim that E to the power H so this 
e, the exponential of this generating series is 1 over, so it's, okay, sum over k, right? 1 over k factorial uh, e to the power p of e to the power t2. Uh, sorry, beta, beta times t2. Right, <coughs> this is the correct formula. So where does this come from? What, what does it say? So t2 is the sum of all possible transpositions. Here I raise t2 to some power m, right? This thing here is the sum of beta to the m, t2 to the m over m factorial. So I raise the product of all transpositions to the power m. That means that I consider all possible products of m transpositions. And the product of m transpositions is the monodromy, is the product of monodromy is here of the covering. If I take the monodromy is around these simple branch points, I get transpositions. If I go around all of them one by one, I get a product of m transpositions. Yeah. So altogether, I'm going to get the transposition of the big cycle like that. Yes? Yeah. Uh, not really good. P, you see, this T2 depends on K, yeah? It's, it's a grouping of symmetric group K. Yes. And uh, yeah, yeah, but for, for every K, yeah, you mean. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, no, because on, on, on one or K factorial, then, then subsequent which doesn't depend on K, yeah. You should maybe put K as a, some kind of parenthesis. Uh, here, you mean? In T2, yeah. Over, yes, yeah. But, it's, but it's better, it's actually better oh, this way. It's a universal thing for every. Maybe on P, yeah, because it things depends on K, yeah, it's, it makes no sense. B, B of sigma is well defined for any size of sigma, actually. Oh, okay, yeah. So a, and I T2, you are right. So T2 should be, should actually... Because should actually direct sum of group rings of all symmetry groups. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. But you are right, T2 actually depends on K, and I should, yeah, I could, I could write a K here, but yeah, it's... Because it's... it's it may be better not to, actually. It's, it, is, it is what is called a stable, uh, stable uh, conjugacy class. The transposition exists, the sum of transpositions exists for any K. You can take it for any k. No, 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 no. It says it, it's impossible to understand the formula. It's so, what sum over k, one over k factorials, yeah. x number e, and then multiply by something which doesn't depend on. You know, the kind of grammatical ah, formula doesn't make sense. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. If you if you if you prefer k okay, here, I can put it, but it's yeah. Is that, no, it doesn't okay. make sense because that's yeah. very simple. Okay. Right, so <coughs> once again, I take the product of m transpositions at all possible ways, so all, for all choices of m transpositions, and then I look at the, uh, at the length of the cycles, of the cycle structure of the uh, permutation that I obtain as the product. And my goal is to obtain the permutation with cycles of length k1, k2, k, uh, kn, and so on. So if I obtain a permutation like that, this p here will give me pk1 times pk2 times pkn, right? So in front of pk1 times pk2 times pkn, I will have exactly the number of ways of representing a permutation with these lengths of cycles as a product of m transpositions. And this is exactly the way to enumerate ramified coverings. And uh, <coughs> just one uh, thing that is, uh, well, I have to take the exponential of the generating function because when I take this pro product of transpositions, I don't know if the ramified covering is going to be connected or not. So if I do it like that, I actually obtain the generating series for possibly disconnected ramified coverings. And this is e to the power h. Is, is this the bound side formula? This is the what? Bound side? Uh, this one, yeah, yeah. Yes. So actually, yeah, I, I, I can put, I, I can push this one step further. Um, so this is also equal the sum over k, uh, e to the power beta t2 of Lambda, so sum, sum over uh, partitions of k, representations of sk, actually. Lambda here is a partition of k that represents a representation of sk, uh, times the sure polynomial of 
P1 and so on, Pk. So this is a way to this is a way to compute the power of this element, right? So now I have this G2, it's the sum of all transpositions in SK. It's actually an element, it's actually an element of the <coughs> center of the group algebra of SK. Right? It's a formal, it's a linear combination of transpositions, so it's in the group algebra of SK, and it's actually an element of the center because I take a symmetric thing, the sum of all transpositions. So now how do I raise it to the power m? How do I, or how do I compute it exponential? Uh, the answer th is that the, the nice way to do it is to decompose it into uh, idempotence, into a sum of idempotence. So in this, this center of the group algebra, it's a commutative uh, semi-simple algebra, which means that it, it has, it has uh, idempotent elements. So for every representation lambda, there's an element in here that acts by 1 in representation lambda and by 0 in all other representations. And then if I raise it to powers, I get the same elements all over, over and over again. Right? So in general, if I want to raise an element to a power, I should look at, at its action in every irreducible representation and raise it to the corresponding power. So t lambda, t2 of lambda T2 of lambda is the action of T2 in representation lambda, in representation lambda, representation lambda. Right? It's a central element, so in each irreducible representation it will act just by a scalar. And T2 of lambda is this scalar. And if you know the representation theory of the symmetric group really well, you should know the formula for T2 of lambda. If you don't know it so well, it's a difficult exercise. <laughs> so it's a one half sum i greater than or equal to one uh, lambda i minus i plus one half squared minus minus i plus one half squared, where lambda is equal to lambda 1, greater than or equal to lambda 2, greater than or equal to lambda 3, and so on. So when I have a partition, I represent it by a decreasing sequence, or not increasing sequence of its elements. Then I make this small shift. Instead of every lambda i, I write lambda i minus i plus 1 half. So that this sequence is now strictly decreasing. And this is more or less a renormalized sum of squares of these shifted coordinates. So you can notice that well, this, this sequence actually finishes with an infinite number of zeros. Right? There's only a finite number of non-zero elements. After that, they are, they are all zeros. And when lambda i is equal to zero, I just have a difference of two similar terms, of two equal terms. So this is an infinite sum, but actually it has only a finite number of non-zero terms. It is, is well-defined. And uh, morally, if you forget about this part, it's just the sum of squares of all these elements. And this is added for, for it to converge. OK, so now I go in cycles and I can <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe I should. I will continue here. And then. OK. So you need just a number? This is just a number. So that's a function of, on all possible partitions all possible partitions of all k, right? Because the sum of transpositions exists in every sk, so for any partition of any number, I can look by what scalar the sum of transpositions acts in this irreducible representation. This is the number that I get. Okay, so now I want to <coughs> write a more complicated ELSE formula that will depend on a parameter, parameter r greater than or equal to 1. So it's an integer. Right, so from now, from now on, I fix an integer r greater than or equal to 1. And if r is equal to 1, I will find the usual LSP formula. So the first thing I do, I will go in the opposite direction. I will start, start by changing the Herbert's numbers. So now, first, I have to define tr plus 1 of lambda. 
So the recipe is very simple. Everywhere you see 2, you replace it by r plus 1. Almost everywhere. There's this one half, this stays one half. So 1 over r plus 1. Sum for i greater than or equal to 1. Lambda i minus i plus 1 half to the power r plus 1. Minus minus i plus 1 half to the power r plus 1. Right? This is once again a function on all partitions of all integers. And the question is, does it represent anything? So it actually, well, it, it's not such a, it's, it represents, it is actually a very good function. It represents what is called completed cycles. For example, I will write you just one equality. T3 of lambda, for example, can be decomposed in the following way. 3 plus 1, 1 plus 1 twelfth times 1. So that means that T3 of lambda is uh, the sum of three cycles. Sum of three cycles. Plus, uh, so here I have uh, tr the trivial <coughs> permutation, but with two distinguished elements. So actually, n times, sorry, k times k minus 1 over times the trivial permutation. And here I have 1 12th times, once again, the trivial permutation, but with one distinguished element. So k over 12 times the identity. So this is, again, an element in the center of the group algebra. And this element acts in this way in every representation. And there's a similar formula for any R, but it gets more and more complicated. There's an expression for the things for that you should put here, but it's not the, I mean, it's not the most beautiful way to see them. So this, these things are rather, well, are rather mysterious, and this is actually the reason why the formula is still not proved. Because you have to find the find these coefficients in, in a geometric way, and I still cannot do that. But now, okay, now once you have uh, once you have these t's, you can define the new generating series for R Hermit's numbers H G R K one K N. Let's let me let me start with so e to the power h sub r of beta k1 kn of b1 b2 and so on write exactly by the same formula sum over k 1 over k factorial uh, uh, no, sorry, no, now I have to write the, the, second, the second version, right? So sum over partitions of k, uh, e to the power beta tr plus 1 of lambda uh, times the Schur polynomial. That gives me a new power series, and if I take its coefficient, B1, B2, and so on. Its coefficients are called R spin Hurwitz numbers. K1, Kn. Once again, so here I should write beta to the m divided by m factorial, and here Pk1, Pkn over m factorial. Right, so now everywhere I have this parameter r. <coughs> so these are some new numbers. Something like coverage roughly this sure fed per fault. Yeah, so yeah, roughly, yeah, yeah. Roughly. Roughly. Uh, these are yeah, yeah coverings, so yeah. Coverings 
from the genus G surface to CP1 uh, such that such that DF has an earth root has an earth root so that means that uh, critical points right critical points are zeros of DF if DF has an earth root it means that critical points go by uh, by collections of R. But, but on, the, that's the maximum or is it everywhere or on F? Sorry? So all critical points have, a, have this R. Every critical point has, yeah, so, m well, it's, uh, there, there are some boundary contributions. So let me, let me draw a picture for, again, for, for T3. So I, I, right, I wrote this equality, 3 plus 1, 1 plus 1, 12, times 1. So now I can draw a picture associated with every term. This thing is just a critical point that behaves like where, so where this map F locally behaves like Z, Z, Z cubed. So that's a double critical point. But then I also have a contracted component of genus 0 that is attached to two sheets of the covering. And here I have a contracted component of genus 1 that is, con that is attached to one sheet of the covering. So here I have a, I have a covering uh, with two distinguished sheets, and they are distinguished because there is actually a genus 0 component that, uh, that is attached to them. And here I have a covering with one distinguished sheet because there is actually a genus 1 contracted component. So you see these are actually stable maps. Stable maps can have contracted components. And the image of these contracted components are counted as branch points with some multiplicities. There's a formula that gives you the, the multiplicity, and the, the formula gives you two in all three cases. And these are exactly the three possible cases. It's called the branching morphism that extends the notion of multiplicity of a branch point to stable maps. OK. And so now I can write the, the corresponding ILSV formula. Uh, yeah, okay, let's. I guess I'll have to erase this, and, but it's very similar. So H, G, R, K1, Kn is equal to. M factorial, and this time M is uh, 2G minus 2 plus N plus K divided by R. So, as I, as I said, the critical points now go by collections of R, so the, the number of different branch points is divided by R compared to the previous, to the, to the ordinary case. Now there is a power of A here that I never remember by heart, uh, m plus n plus 2g, m plus n plus 2g minus 2. Uh, sorry, there is also the combinatorial factor, ki over r to the power <coughs> pi over pi factorial. So I'll explain the notation. Uh, and here I have the, what is called the space of R spin structures. So once again, I will, I will explain what it is. Here is uh, minus R star B push forward of L. Now there are some new things, but Okay, so that's the formula. Now, once again, I have to explain all the letters.
Okay, so first of all, there are these numbers k1, kn that corresponds to the that correspond to the branching at infinity. And I have to write each of them, I have to divide each of them by r and write the quotient and the remainder. It's going to be r pi plus r minus 1 minus ai. So that's the quotient and that's the remainder that for historical reasons has to be reversed. Instead of going from 0 to r minus 1, you go from r minus 1 to 0. Right, so from each number ki, you get the number pi and the number ai automatically. Uh, and this already explains the combinatorial factor here and the indices that are here. But I still have to explain what this space is. And the space mg1 over r a1 a n is the space of, so it's stable curves of genus G with n marked points and with a line bundle uh, such that its rth power is isomorphic to, is identified with the cotangent line bundle twisted by sum of minus a i x i. So this thing is called an R spin structure. Once again, an R spin structure is an R tensor root of the cotangent line bundle. So here I have the cotangent line bundle. I twist it by some divisor supported on the, on the marked points. And then uh, I, I take the R root. And the, so the first term class of this, let's say, the first term class of this line bundle is 2g minus 2 minus sum of the i's, and it should be divisible by r. Other way, otherwise, it doesn't work. Right? If you want to extract an r tensor root, it has to be divisible by r. And that's the same condition <coughs> as this. Right here, in order to get an integer m, you also have a condition of divisibility by r. It's actually the same condition. So the integral is well defined if and only if this m is integer, and that's <coughs> the situation where the Hurwitz number exists to begin with. So why do I why do I look at this space? Uh, that's once again. So if you look at this, if you look at this uh, explanation, when you have so you have a ramified covering like that, right? So it has poles. F has poles. Let me write it here. F has poles uh, of order ki at xi. Right? It has m poles, so I call these poles x1, xn. So F has the pole of order ki as a, as at xi. So df has a pole of order ki plus 1. Right? At xi. Uh, and this is equal to uh, r times pi plus 1 minus ai. Right? If I rewrite k, ki like that, I obtain r times pi plus another r. There's a plus 1 that kills this minus 1, so I, still, I just have a minus ai. Right? And that means that if I take a square root, uh, sorry, an off root of df, it will has a pole of order pi plus 1. And this is the thing that I have to twist the cotangent line bundle with in order for this to be divisible by r. Right? If I want this to be divisible by r, I have to, well, to, uh, at the beginning it's not, so I have to twist the, the line bundle by this minus, a time, minus ai times xi, and then the pole will be of order r times pi plus 1, and I will be able to, ex to extract the rth root.
Okay. And so now I have to explain one last thing. That's the uh, this thing in the numerator. Uh, and this thing is the numerator is as follows. So here I have my moduli space of our spin structures. Over this moduli space I have the universal curve. And I also have, let's call this pi as before, and I also have the universal R spin structure. Since this is the space of R spin structures, it means that on the universal curve I have the universal R spin structure. So here I have a line bundle on each fiber and the union of these line bundles gives me a line bundle over the whole universal curve and its rth power is the cotangent line bundle to the to the fibers and now I can look at the push forward of so the sheaf of sections of this line bundle and take its push forward I mean the push forward is this r star so the the derived functor so more or less on each curve I can take h0 of cl and h1 of cl and the formal difference h0 minus h1 glues into two sheaves that are called r0 p star of l and r1 p star of l right this is for one curve and this is if I do it on the whole on the whole moduli space, I obtain two sheaves, and uh, so R star P star of L is equal to R zero P star of L minus R one P star of L. It's a <coughs> rather common construction. This is what you see in the Grotten de Kriemann rock formula, for example. And you can check that in the case of r equal 1, if r equals 1, you obtain the, here exactly the, uh, you obtain actually minus the Hodge bundle. So the, here you obtain the churn, the churn class of the dual of the Hodge bundle, exactly as you should. Because if r is equal to 1, this L here is just the cotangent line bundle. So it's, it's H0 is the Hodge bundle. And it's H1 is uh, the trivial line bundle C, so it has no churn class. Okay. I would like to make one remark on this R spin uh, Hurwitz numbers before I continue. Uh, that's in order to make them more attractive. So these expressions here, <coughs> these TR plus 1 of lambda, I learned them from a paper by Okunkov and Panderipande where they compute gromov witten invariants of curves. So it actually turns out that this thing is related to <coughs> the class Psi to the power R. And I can write, I can write a concrete equality. So this Hurwitz number H, G, R, K1, Kn is equal to a gromov witten invariant so if I take the space of um, relative maps, so uh, the space of maps to CP1 relative to infinity of degree k, uh, and the branching at infinity, so if it's relative to infinity, it means that I have to prescribe a ramification profile at infinity. The ramification profile is prescribed by k1, kn. So that's a space of relative stable maps. It has a virtual fundamental class. And I can, uh, yeah, sorry, and I should add m marked points here. 
marked points. Marked points and k is the degree of the map. Degree. So now I have m more marked points and I can write r factorial psi 1 to the power r times and so on times r factorial psi m uh, sorry, psi 1 to the power r times the pull back by the evaluation map of a point. That's the, the block. And same thing, r factorial psi m to the power r, the pull back of the class of a point by the evaluation map. So I have m marked points, I fix their images because every time I take the pull back of a point by the evaluation map. And after fixing their images, I also put rth powers of psi class on each of them. And this, give, this will be exactly equal to this Hurwitz number, r spin Hurwitz number. And again, the relation between the two is not clear. So, I mean, th this is, I mean, th th this thing is proved. This is, this is proved by Malkinkov and Bunderiklander. But it's not clear why it should be related to integrals on the space of R-spin structures. <coughs> so if you prefer, you can reformulate the RLSV formula by replacing this number here by this ramov witten invariant. Okay, so now finally I come to the topological recursion. Yes, so the, uh, I mean, th this formula is proved. So this is, this is the R spin Hurwitz number that I defined using this completed the, the, the mm -hmm. representation theory. And this is a gromov witten invariant. Right? And this formula is a conjecture. So I should maybe write uh, an exclamation mark here and a question mark here. <laughs> Otherwise, it's not. Right. So, since you know that these numbers are equal, you can take this number and put it here, and you get a, an equivalent conjecture. <laughs> and in this way, you have a, an equality between two integrals. One is the integral of, on the space of uh, relative stable maps with some powers of psi classes, and here you have a space on the, uh, an integral in the space of first spin structures. And it's not clear why they are why they are equal to each other. It seems like there's a connection between the virtual fundamental classes hiding somewhere, but I don't know. Uh, okay. So the relation with the topological recursion. There are more properties of the Herbert's numbers. So the first property is called the Bouchard-Marigne Bouchard conjecture uh, that is that it was actually proved since uh, which says that the curve the uh, plane curve x equals log y minus y is the spectral curve is the spectral curve for Hurwitz numbers. So more precisely, if I write H, G, N, right, maybe I should write W, G, N. Um, of X1, X, N equals sum over k1, kn, uh, 1 over n factorial, e to the power sum of the ki, xi, uh, sorry, and the, the Hurwitz number, gk1, kn. 
and also I forgot the e to the beta to the m over m factorial. So here I also should sum over. No, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. <coughs> and again, m here is expressed through the, from this genus. So maybe no, sorry. So then, sorry, sorry. You probably don't need it here because there is just one m. Once you fix, no, 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 no. <laughs> okay. Once again, beta to the m over m factorial. Okay. So these things here, well, these are these are functions, but you can transform them into you can transform them into uh, differential forms by differentiating once with respect to each x i. And then what you obtain are the, the invariance, the topological recursion invariance for this spectral curve. So it, it was a conjecture for some time, and then it was proved <coughs> uh, from the ELSE formula. And there's a similar conjecture for these r spin Hurwitz numbers. The R Bouchama Bouchama Marinho that says that the curve uh, x equals log y minus y to the R is the spectral curve in the spectral curve. For R spin Hurwitz numbers. Hurwitz numbers. And once again, this is still open. So the only theorem I can boast of today is that these two conjectures are equivalent. So that's the. <laughs> The main theorem of the talk is that the RLSV conjecture and the R. Bouchard Marinia formula are equivalent to each other. So if someone proves one of them, both will be proved at the same time. Maybe I should write that down since that's the main theorem. Right, let me write it here. RLSV is equivalent to or Bouchard Marinho. Okay. Uh, yeah, I still have a couple of minutes, right? So I can, I'll try to explain a little bit how the equivalence is proved. So just to make sure you understand, right, once you have the spectral curve, there's the topological recursion procedure that allows you to compute everything, to compute all the Hurwitz numbers, right, one by one. And the ELSV formula also allows you to do that if you can compute some integrals on the moduli space. So in principle, both determine the Hurwitz numbers <coughs> uniquely, and you can prove that. Well, you can, we can prove that that's the. It's the same, it gives the same numbers. Yeah, that's, I should also write, that's joint with Luke, Spitz, and Sergei Shadow. Okay, so how does the proof work? First of all, we have to look at the numerators of these formulas. In the ELSV formula, you have the dual of the Hodge bundle. And in the R ELSV formula, you have this, the churn class of the push minus the push forward of the spinner bundle. So these things are actually semi-simple cohomological field theories.
I'm not going to tell you what that means, but <coughs> the important thing is that semi-simple cohomological field theories are classified, and they are determined by one matrix value power series. So completely described, described by a matrix valued power series. Matrix valued power series. It's the give <coughs> the given tile R matrix. So the power series for for the first one. Uh, here you have matrices one by one, so it's actually just one power series. It corresponds to the exponential of minus sum of the okay, k greater than or equal to 1, bk plus 1 over k, k plus 1, uh, t to the k. <coughs> so that's, that's the Bernoulli number. Uh, so actually, one term out of two is equal to zero because the Bernoulli number vanish, <coughs> the odd Bernoulli number vanish. So I'm not going to describe you completely the classification of cohomological field theories. It would be it would take too long, but I will show you how, in this particular case, uh, what this formula, I mean, what this power series uh, tell us uh, tells us about. Uh, the trend class of the Hodge bundle. So there is an expression called the Mumford formula. Mumford's formula obtained by the <coughs> by the applying the Grattan de Krimenor formula to the universal curve. And it gives us the churn character, the churn class sorry of the Uh, of the dual to the Hodge bundle, so it's exponential uh, sum, so minus sum k greater than or equal to 1, um, bk plus 1 over k times k plus 1, I'll write it like that, times Uh, the class kappa k minus sum from <coughs> for i from 1 to n psi i to the power k and plus 1 half delta, delta is the boundary and here have psi 1 to the k plus psi double prime to the k divided by psi prime plus psi double prime um, so when you have a when you have a boundary stratum like that, you have two psi classes at the at the node. At the node, you have two branches that meet. So you have two cotangent lines to the branches. So you have two extra psi classes. You have, as usual, the usual psi classes attached to the marked points, the cotangent line to the marked points here. But on this boundary divide on this boundary uh, divisor, you also have the cotangent lines to the to the attachment points of the of the two of the two branches, so you have also two extra psi classes, psi prime and psi double prime, and here's the expression. So as you as you see, as you see, you can you see well you can see the power series that appears <coughs> in front of some expression of uh, classes on the moduli spaces on the moduli space. And there's a similar formula Yeah. I have to stop in like five minutes, right? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so let me So for the for the R spin for the space of R spin structures, you have this C of minus R star of the push forward of L, 
and this corresponds to a matrix valued power series and the matrix is, uh, the matrix is uh, R times R and the elements here are B K plus 1 so it's let's see, let's see, sum over K again 1 over K K plus 1 and here have B K of B K plus 1 1 over R and so on B K plus 1 R over R. Let me write one more term. B K plus 1, 2 over R. So it's a diagonal matrix. And here have the Bernoulli polynomials, and you take the values of the Bernoulli polynomials at the rational points with the denominator R. So once again, you see that if you take R equals 1, you just get this term, which is exactly the Bernoulli number the value of the Bernoulli polynomial at the point 1. And this is translated by the by a formula by Alessandro Chiodo for the churn character of this. So that's equal to the exponential of the sum again. Um, minus sum over k, 1 over k, k plus 1, bk plus 1 of 1 over r times kappa k, minus sum from 1 to n, um, b r, bk plus 1, ai plus 1, over r psi i to the power k plus one half yeah I don't know if I want to write the boundary term that's actually r over two okay let me write it down but maybe it's not so so sum from a from zero to r minus one delta a there are actually different types of boundary divisors in the space of our spin structures that are indexed by remainders modulo r I think is not so important now. Psi prime plus psi double prime, and here bk plus 1, a plus 1 over r, psi prime to the power k, minus, uh, plus, sorry, bk plus 1, r minus a minus 1 over r, c double prime to the power k. Okay, it's <coughs> too long, and then I have to close both brackets. <laughs> so once again, you can see all the elements of this matrix appearing in different combinations. And okay, yeah, I wanted to compute one integral, but I think I, ha I, I have to. I have to stop here. But what the so Bertrand <coughs> uh, already mentioned the. The result that topo that the topological recursion and the classification was actually included inside it the classification of semi-simple cohomological field theories by these R matrices. So when you have this R matrix, when you have a when you have a curve, you have the remember the B of Z Z prime or what, z1, z2, that was part of the spectral curve. And then you should take its uh, power series expansions at the critical points and take the Laplace transform, the Laplace transform, transform, and that gives you this, this matrix valued power series matrix valued power series uh, that classifies cohomological field theories. So there's actually a connection between these power series here, this one and this one, and the expansion into power series of the of this two form dz1, dz2 over z1 minus z2 expanded in coordinate y. Right? 
If you have a rational curve, you can take the squared. If you have a rational curve, you have this, this two form, and you can expand it into local coordinates in the neighborhood of critical points. And the coefficients of this expansion should match the coefficients of this power series after the, the Laplace transform. And so the, <coughs> the Laplace transform is, uh, is some integral, right? The Laplace transform of f is something like that. Easy. And this integral, when you write it for this spectral curve, this integral happens to give you uh, the inverse of the, the, the gamma function, more or less. Actually, 1 over the gamma function. And I don't know if you know that, but these power series, both these and this here, they actually asymptotic expansions of the gamma function. The Stirling formula, exactly. The Stirling formula is the leading term. Gamma of t is equivalent, right, to square root of 2 pi t, t to the power t minus 1, e to the t times the exponential of this thing, but with a plus sign. So when you have 1 over the gamma function, and these actually things appear in front of the integral, so they simplify. And in the end, you get exactly this power series, this, the power series that you want. So the connection between the connection between the ELSV formula or the RLSV formula and the spectral curve is that when when you make when you compute some integrals at the neighborhood of branch points of this curve, you get the reciprocal of the gamma function, that's whose uh, symptotic expansion is given by these power series here and here. And I think I have to stop here. Thank you.